Maybe you've heard about uh, the man who died and he went to heaven and he appears before the great pearly gate. And there's St. Peter. He says, hi, can I help you? And the man says, I'd just like to get into heaven. And St. Peter said, well, have you, have you earned the, the mandatory 100 points? And the man said, I've never heard of that uh, down on earth, but okay. He um, said, uh, I attended church all my life. I was baptized as an infant. I went through catechism class. I was confirmed. I went to all the youth groups. I went to Christian school. I graduated first in my class from a Christian college. I met a young Christian lady, married her. We attended church three times a week, Sunday morning, evening, the prayer meeting. I gave 10% of my income to the Lord's work. I served as a deacon. My wife and I sang in the choir. We gave uh, to missionaries above and beyond our 10%. We had three beautiful daughters. All went to Christian schools and colleges. One ended up marrying a minister. One ended up marrying a doctor on the mission field. One ended up marrying a fellow in the Peace Corps. Uh, we served the Lord faithfully. I was a banker, and I would help people with low incomes to get loans. I helped out in the community. I was the president of Kiwanis. I was a scout master of Troop 105. When our kids left the house, my income increased. We gave 30% to the Lord's work. When I retired, we served as short-term missionaries in third world countries. We visited rest homes in our community, drove the van for Meals on Wheels on Saturday, and I left my estate of 50% of my assets to the Lord's work. Then he turned to St. Peter and he asked, how am I doing? And St. Peter said, that's one point. And the man said, then there's no way I'm getting in except by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. All right. You know, there's a, a struggle that's familiar to every Christian, and that is the struggle to live by what the Bible might call faith alone. Faith alone simply means that you and I are trusting. We are betting it all. We're letting all ride on our faith and our trust that Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection and the way he lived did everything required. How much is everything? Everything required, and there's nothing less left for us to be done, <clears throat> nothing left for us to do, to free us from the powers of sin and death and open the door to heaven for us. And it's difficult for us to be convinced that something more is not also necessary for our, as the Bible calls it, justification which is simply our being made okay with God. We're always asking if there isn't something else we can do or something else we can be to be sure of God's approval. And that's because that is part of our inability to accept a gift. And deeper than that, you and I actually want to be loved because of what we do for God. You see, it's God's unconditional love that's very difficult for us to receive. Unconditional. And if we have a hard time accepting God's unconditional love, you will find out that you have a difficult time expressing unconditional love to other people. Because at the root, if you think life is about trying to earn God's love, that goes so deep into your very soul, it will affect how you treat people, all of your relationships. If you're married, if you're a parent, a friend, whoever you deal with, you will love them if, you will love them if they do your list. That's what's happening in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. And as we continue in our study of the book of Acts, it's my belief that the Lord wants to meet us in his word and bring us back to the core of our spiritual freedom, our mental freedom, our relational freedom, our interpersonal freedom. And that is all rooted in Jesus paying everything that we owe the Heavenly Father. And we've got no greater need than to discover repeatedly, and I mean repeatedly, we've got to keep discovering this truth in our lives. Otherwise, we keep falling back into performance-based acceptance. We do it with God. I do it all the time. No. 
I mean, I will feel like if I prayed, all of a sudden I didn't pray enough. If I read the Bible, I didn't read enough. If I, I'm just not being good enough. I'm not doing the list enough. I'm not doing the, the treadmill enough. And so maybe God's now not going to love me as much as he did last month or last year when I was doing the list better. Am I alone? You know, it's interesting. Huh? So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 15, please. Otherwise, you can just listen on. And I want you, if you were here last week, you'd remember that at the close of the 14th chapter, Paul and Barnabas, they've just returned to Antioch, and that's the place where they were commissioned and, and prayerfully set out on this missionary journey of, of the, the first church. And they gathered these believers together uh, to give a report and they wanted to say, hey, this, this is what we experienced while, you, while we were out, after you sent us out. You know, we, they, they met people, they, they led people to, to know Jesus and to receive Jesus for the first time as, as their Lord and their Savior. And uh, so they came back to talk about what happened. And they included that they saw something really wild, which is for the Jew, it was just earth shattering. That the God of their Bible, the God of what we would call the Old Testament, was also a God of what he was writing in what we'd call a New Testament, the New Covenant, actually in the Greek language, it would be the New Covenant. It's a new way of doing things uh, with how we get right with God. And so the Old Testament, if we could sum it, summarize it, it's about what you do. It's what, what you sacrifice. It's how well you do the list. And when you don't measure up and you fall short of the list, the laws, the Ten Commandments, and a whole bunch of other things, then something else has to die in your place, shed its blood in place of yours. So you don't have to shed your blood to get right with God. So that covers your sin. And then you flip over into this New Testament where also Jesus shows up on the page. And Jesus, he claims it's going to be him shedding his blood that is so powerful, pure, it's perfect, it will actually cover all of your sins forever. You don't have to sacrifice any, any animal. You don't have to do spiritual push-ups. He did everything. And strangely, you get to ride on his coattails for absolutely free. It's yours for the asking. But what really... Was, was creeping out the, the Jews who, who heard this, even though they were believers in Jesus, was that when Paul and Barnabas brought that news to people, some of the people that heard and believed that Jesus was the Messiah that the Jews believed would one day come and be the final sacrifice and, and make everything right between us and, and our creator, that non-Jews... The New Testament simply calls Gentiles. It's anybody who's not a Jew. It's a catch-all term. The Gentiles believed in Jesus and, and, and became his followers. A lot of Jews were still hung up on, no, 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 no. God only loves us. Only we have that history. God only did all those miraculous things and, and spoke to us and sent us the prophets and etc. It's just for us. Nobody else. Well, this was the eye-opener for them. And as we're going to see this morning, they discover that some other people have just come to town, to Antioch, and they were saying something very different than what Paul was saying, and that was that God's love was not unconditional. That Jesus was only part of, of the ladder to salvation and not the only ladder. And there were three stages in this event. It's going to take a couple few weeks to get through. There was a dispute. There was this defense. And there was a decision that was made. We're going to look at the dispute this morning. Okay, we're going to unpack these verses one by one. Chapter 15, verse 1. Here it is. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the Christians there. Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And here now we get to talk about the thing that it's a favorite thing of pastors to talk about is circumcision. It's just, it's just fantastic. <laughs> and if anybody's here for the first time this Sunday, you know, I am sorry. <clears throat> so these men, 
They come down from Judea to Antioch. They appear to be the same people that Paul actually writes about in another letter that he wrote called Galatians. Okay? This is, this is, this is where Galatians, it's the impetus for Galatians. Chapter 2, uh, ver, uh, chapter two verse 12, he writes about this event. And they were historically referred to as Judaizers. You know, a sanitizer makes everything sanitary. A Judaizer would try to make everybody Jewish. Jewish. That's what that was. So unlike Paul and Barnabas, they, they have no authority, these Judaizers, from the headquarter church in Jerusalem. And when I say headquarter church, I sure hope you don't have in your mind, you know, some, some image of kind of the, the papacy and, and big robes and big hats and staffs and weird things and incense. It's people like this that are simply... Um, Fresh from Jesus working on earth, they were uh, the, the apostles, you know, the 12 disciples, and some of them. Uh, we don't know exactly who and how many, but they're there in Jerusalem, and they're doing the thing that Jesus said to do. They're launching this new global thing, this new way of getting right with God through the story of Jesus and through what he did on the cross. Okay. And so there are some new Christians that are also there in Antioch. With, with, with these, some of these believers, or these, uh, these former uh, disciples now called apostles. And they're, they're listening to the story uh, from Paul and Barnabas. And now these other folks are coming in. And I simply want to say that um, uh, this group that Paul refers to in, in Galatians, uh, they come preaching their own message. That Paul even said, they, they called it a gospel. It was a twist of the one true gospel. Gospel means what? Simply means good news. That Jesus did it all on the cross. That's the good news. Jesus took care of everything. We don't have to do it. Except believe that he did it all. Okay. And so, uh, their message was simply that the cross of Jesus plus Jewish customs is what saves you from sin and death. And they would claim that after all, Jesus himself said that Jesus, Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And that meant to them that even Jesus was saying that, that it was the law plus Jesus as the basis for salvation. So you got to do the list. And, and that's why the Pharisees saw Paul's preaching and his work to the Gentiles and, and receiving them fully into the family of Jesus, if they believed in Jesus, as despicable. And so they organized their forces for a once and for all confrontation to stop them. And that's what we're entering right here in chapter 15. And they, they base their theology out of passages like Genesis 17, where there's that ritual of circumcision, where it appears for the first time in our Bible, back in the day of Abraham. When all other religions on earth were pagan, they were sexually perverse, they were downright demonic. And, and I, I, I want to remind you, that when God created humankind, as we read at the very beginning of Genesis, God gave them two directives, and one of them was to have children, to be fruitful and to multiply. He gave you sex. That's what he did. He, he simply was saying, I want you to have sexual intercourse and a lot of it. With the one person I give you in a, in a monogamous marriage, I want to remind you of the clean blood supply of the world is dependent on the monogamous heterosexual relationship. That's why the, the Red Cross likes to pull its little blood mobiles up to churches. Get blood from churchgoers. Because they have a better, better guarantee of monogamous heterosexual people. Clean blood supply. So with all things that God has created, pure, right, uh, the devil comes along and he twists things and he makes it common. And instead of, you know, the sexual union is incredibly deep. It is soulful. And unlike what, what you know, uh, the world tries to paint this as, as to be, and especially for guys, I'm going to stand up for guys here. Uh, in, in marriage, can, can we just talk shop here? <clears throat> okay, in, 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 in marriage, and that's where it's supposed to be, and only in the context of marriage, 
Um, when, when, a, when a male um, has a need to be sexually intimate with, with his wife, it is not as the culture would have you think and as the culture actually has created to be and actually, let's say, lives out in experiences, it's just for the feeling, just for the climax, it's just for, it's the high, and that's all it is. It is, it is merely fleshly. It's designed, um, and, and guys, I know you're going to read my mail here. Most females do not understand what it is for a male to be physically intimate with his wife. Um, it is a communication of you belong to me. And it is an enveloping, it is a, it is a man completely surrounding outside, inside, and becoming one as it was originally created in Genesis, as it's described. They become like this one flesh, they're one person. You can't get any closer than that. Uh, just had a thought. I remember an old Groucho Marx thing where there's a lady hugging him. And she says, hold me closer, closer. He says, yeah, if I get any closer, I'd be on the other side of you. Remember that? <laughs> Whatever. Came from, I don't know where it came from. <clears throat> it's the coffee. Whatever. So, where was I? <clears throat> so, after the fall, after the fall, everything falls apart. Everything gets twisted. Everything that God made pure and wonderful just gets, just gets bizarre. It gets twisted, and and uh, our our sexuality, human sexuality, just got from the beginning. Instead of this uh, res being reserved for this this covenant relationship, it was the devil tempting you. Yeah, I have sex with anybody and whatever, male, female, male, male, female, female, whatever. Why do you think we're we're seeing what we're seeing in our day, an, an absolute uptick in in um, sexual unrestraint? Well, that's part of one of the things that Jesus said is going to happen to the earth. It's what the earth is going to look like before he returns. When he says the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the world is going to be like it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what he's describing. And that's what we're seeing. So God tells Abraham back then, and it's in the book of, of Genesis. God says, okay, buddy, I, listen, I'm going to take you and your wife, and we're, we're, we're going to do a do-over. I, I want to create a family, a nation for myself that listens to me because the world's in rebellion to me. So I'm picking the two of you, and, 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 um, and I, want to, I want to put a very special mark on every guy because you really need it. Because of how I designed you to be with, with the, the, the sexual component of a relationship because you guys are as fallen creatures. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, God didn't say this. I'm just kind of. I'm padding what's in here, okay? <clears throat> but I think I can, we can say this is the reason. And, and God does not put the, this mark uh, on the thigh. I said this before. He doesn't say cut off the pinky. Uh, he, it's not a tattoo. It's right on his sexual organ, and it's circumcision. And you go, man, that's, that's strange. God knows, no, we're getting serious. Um. And we're starting right now with you who are adults. Okay? And, um, and every time you get changed in the morning, every time you get dressed, you'll have reason to remember that your sex life belongs to me. And your offspring belongs to me. Your family belongs to me. And that happened at a time when all the world religions at the time were sexually perverse. And I want to remind you, there were worship services in that day where um, people would come to their temples and there would have uh, people on the platform up front literally having sex. Um, even having, you know, somebody give birth live. Um, this is a fact. And then as soon as a baby, baby was born, the, the priest of Chemosh or Molech, uh, ancient religions, would uh, sacrifice that child on flames to their God. So you can imagine God says, okay, uh, we're, we're going to start uh, over again. And this is, this is where this, this goes. 
You can understand then why the Judaizers in the days of Rome, because the New Testament's when Rome's in charge. Rome, jolly, we're on our way to becoming like Rome. But Rome was perverse. Open marriages, and I want to remind you, um, a Caesar, he had a whole bunch of wives, and two of them were boys. You hearing me? Don't be surprised if to find someday the court rule that pedophilia is now lawful and they're trying. That's, that's, um, there's folks attempting that. Now, again, you need to hear this because this is happening and people want this. Okay. So circumcision is nothing but an outward sign of an inward commitment, an internal in, inward relationship that we have with God. That's the, that's the idea. And so in Romans chapter two, Paul writes that the outward sign of circumcision is worthless to God without inward commitment. Verse 29, he says this, rather a, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It's spiritual, it's not literal. Such a person, he says, receives praise from others, not from God. Um, when you remember that the name Jew comes from Judah, uh, the name of one of, um, one of Jacob's sons, and the name, the word Judah means praise, that verse takes on a whole new meaning, uh, because the meaning behind the name Jew was that they don't care about praise from humankind. They want the praise of God, and they praise God. That's, that's what the name means, okay? They want God's approval, not humankind's approval. But here's these Judaizers who are doing all the outside stuff for humankind's approval. And so I, I'll simply say this. If circumcision was the ritual and the outward sign of a man's commitment to God before the time of Christ, then the equivalent today is clearly baptism. But that's for everybody, male and female. But baptism, okay, Circumcision, the Judaizers were saying that you have to do that if you're a guy and that will help set up your whole family to be okay, to be approved with God. You do these Jewish rituals, plus you believe in Jesus, you believe in Jesus, then you're going to get in. Circumcision, as Paul just said, it doesn't do anything for you. It's, it's, it's worthless unless you have this inward commitment right, to God. How about baptism? Does it do anything for you? There are people that, that I've heard, my goodness, they, they trust in the ritual of baptism. Like Jews trust in the ritual of circumcision. Uh, my phone has rung uh, over the years with parents in the community asking me to baptize their kid. And I ask why they want it. And they reply, well, in case anything happens to my child, I want to make sure that they go to heaven. Do you understand what they're believing? Okay. So I, I've known adults who, who don't walk with the Lord, but they claim that their baptism is, as infants or at an early age or their confirmation class that they went through, that was proof that they belong to God and, um, and that serves as all that's required for access to heaven when they die. Okay. The ritual in and of itself is completely useless. The outward ritual is only meaningful if it truly reflects a person's inward condition. Ritual serves nobody. It saves nobody. We can't get by on ritual. A wedding ring is an outward sign of an inward commitment, but it means squat if you don't have the inward commitment. And there's many, many people that trust in church membership. I've met people, when I ask if they're a believer, they say, oh, yes, I've been a member of... As soon as I hear that, I, I know they're checking that box, Okay. Oh, I've been a member of such and such a church for 40 years, etc. And they believe that God is like happy with them because they joined a church. Nah. nah. <laughs> he wants us to be a part of a church. But uh, being a part of a church uh, does not make him love you more or now is, is, is serves as your, uh, your COVID pass. I mean, your entrance pass <laughs> into heaven. So I want to ask you, what are you trusting Right now, what are you trusting in to make you right with God? I mean, listen, search your heart. Are you, are you trusting in anything? This is a serious moment right here. 
If you are trusting in anything that you're doing to be right with God, you're not a Christian. That's a fact. If you are trusting in what you are doing in any way, I will ask somebody uh, who, who I, I might invite somebody, do you want to believe in Jesus? Do you want to become a Christian? And I, will, I, will, I usually ask this question. Do you believe Jesus did everything, everything required for you to be made right with God, to be seen right and acceptable in God's eyes, to have all of your sins washed away, and for him to, to receive you now and into eternity? Do you believe that Jesus did it all? It's amazing how often I will hear, well, yeah, but I also know that I need to. And then they give me the list. Then I say, actually, that's not a Christian. So if you want to be a Christian, I need you to now chop off the, the stuff you said after the, yes, I believe. Because it's all Jesus, 100%. We do not get credit at all for entrance into heaven. Amen. Jesus gets all glory, all honor, all praise, all credit. Our fallen nature, again, as I said at the beginning, that's the thing that makes us think, well, it's also what I do because we want to earn God's love. That's part of our, soul, our fallen nature. Part of our sin is actually believing what we do will get us there. Wait, we're imperfect, sinful creatures. We screw up every day, but we think we can somehow get to heaven, the, the perfect place, and live with a flawless God who made everything? Did you choose to be born? Here we are, but we think we can assign ourselves to heaven. I don't know, I don't know how to get there. But he's my map. Every world religion except for Christianity, everyone, everyone says this. It is by what you do, it is by your efforts, you will appease the God or the gods. It is by how many times you die and are born again, you're reincarnated, you will work off the bad, you will earn your way to paradise. How's that working? And again, I want to say the reason why Christians look so lazy often compared to the Muslim, the, the Hindu, the Buddhist that look very devout is because we know we're on somebody else's coattails. So our tendency is to be a little lazy because we're not earning our way. So. Acts 15 verse 2. Well, I'm not getting very far, am I? Okay. <laughs> All right. It says, and after Paul and Barnabas had no, no small dissension in debate with them, you can imagine, you know, we're doing it right now. Imagine Paul's getting, he's getting heated. You know, whoa, 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 whoa. You're taking us backwards. We got to do this stuff. I mean, the, the whole plan's been revealed. You cannot, do not dare take away from the perfect life Jesus lived and the death he died and what he suffered. Thinking that wasn't enough. Think about that. How arrogant that is. It's Jesus plus what I do. I will earn my way. That's arrogant. That is, that's why it's sin. It's rooted in sin. So after no small dissension and debate with them, that's the dispute I was telling you about, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others, they were appointed to go up to Jerusalem and discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. Okay, those that, you know, the seasoned veterans of, of, the, the, of the, the Jewish faith who have now become followers of Jesus. So Paul himself, you know, he, he, he came out of years of Hebraic, you know, Jewish legalism. And when he experienced the Spirit of God in his life, and after receiving Jesus into his life, and really realizing this, this whole deal is real, there's actually a God in the universe who now, yeah, he loves me, he's caring for me, leading me, giving you, a, a, you know, new data, new DNA, 
Uh, he wasn't about to go back or let these Judaizers take anybody with him. No wonder he, po- he blew a gasket. And so, you know, sometimes issues, they've got to come to the surface before they can finally be brought out under the lordship of Jesus. And so uh, it was decided the best place to settle this, this question was before the church leaders in Jerusalem. Call that the Supreme Court of the day. They decided, okay, uh, we're not getting anywhere here. Let's, all, let's go to those that walked with Jesus on the earth when he was here, who heard directly from Jesus. Let, let's, let's bounce this off of, off of them because they're the ones who, who will be able to really make the decision who is right. Jesus alone and what he did on the cross, how he lived and how he died, his resurrection, or it's, a, it's by Jesus and what I do to get us saved. In Galatians chapter 2, we actually get more detail. Paul writes about the best moment. Uh, he said he didn't go to Jerusalem because the church sent him. He said it was in response to a revelation of God. God simply told him, listen, buddy, this is, what you, this is how you do it. You go to the Supreme Court. You go to the, you take the whole matter to the church leaders in Jerusalem. So God sends Paul to the place that he needs to go for help. And to the rest of the, uh, the, 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 the apostles of Jesus, the elders of Jerusalem, because the very essence of the gospel, the very future of, of, of what we are today was at stake right there. You understand? So God gives Paul wisdom in how to go about this hearing of sorts. In Galatians chapter 2, he also tells us that once he arrived, he first met in private with the apostles and the elders. He wanted to get their approval before he faced the whole assembly. And they all sided with Paul. That's smart. That's called stacking the deck. Okay. And it gave them a united front against, a front against the Judaizers at, at this big public meeting. And as you know by now, when you're in the midst of you know, some conflict, you may be able to see what God is doing for you or through you at the time. But what you don't see is what future assignment God is even preparing you for in that present conflict. And this confrontation prepared Paul's heart and his mind to receive from God the very words to write the letters of Romans and Galatians. You hearing this? You want to know where Romans and Galatians came from? This. It came in response, out of his heart, in response to this. They came out of this conflict, and they continue to this day to... uh, undermine people's reliance on heritage, ritual, their to-do list. Galatians is primarily taken with this conflict. And after understanding the conflict, it should be no wonder that the, the Paul's letter to the Romans is the most thorough statement of the gospel that God has ever given us. He makes it so clear how we get in. All right? This is exciting stuff. Verse 3. So they were sent on their way by the church, and they, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria. They reported the, con- the conversion of the Gentiles. Hey, Gentiles, these non-Jews, they're believing on, in our Jesus. And brought great joy to all the believers. And when they came to J- Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all that God had done with them. Now, you see that? As they traveled to Jerusalem, they shared about the Gentiles coming to Jesus. And the response was just great joy, it says. The word great, actually, in the original text in the Greek is Magalen. It's where we get the word mega. Mega. And so they're simply saying they just experienced this mammoth excitement. Wow, God is doing something. You know, they were alive at the moment. They were there at the kickstart of the good news of Jesus going global. So the leaders in Jerusalem, they welcomed them. And scarcely the response of the Judaizers are are heard. Um, And and the Judaizers couldn't get excited about Gentiles coming to Jesus. Isn't that sad? Um, You might call that the parable of the prodigal son on a large scale. If you're familiar with Jesus' parable there, the Christian Pharisees, I'm simply going to say, are the the elder brother who believed that they had faithfully paid their dues. And now it was time for the younger brother, the Gentiles, to pay their dues. And they need to prove themselves worthy before coming home. Got it? It's grace versus legalism. Uh, past, pastor and author Max Lucado. Uh, he said some time ago, legalism has no pity on people. Legalism makes my opinion your burden. It makes my opinion your boundary. It makes my opinion your obligation. How many of you love living with legalistic people? You got a legalistic person in your life? They, um, 
They step on your air hose, don't they? That's about the most difficult person to live with. Because, see, again, they make you keep a list because they believe they have to keep a list. Nothing's going to rob a Christian of their joy faster than legalism. Nothing actually will keep a Christian more immature than trying to keep a list. And at the end of verse 4, Paul and his company, they appear to have given their public report by telling them all, it says, all that God had done with them. Notice they pointed to God, what God did. You know, our, our personal testimony is what God has done through us, and that's something that people cannot debate. They can ignore it, but they can't debate it. Verse 5. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. Now, we don't know if the Judaizers got to those guys first or if they were already thinking along those lines. But what we do know is that these Pharisees, who had become Christians, okay, they, they, they'd been trained to respect and obey the law of Moses. Uh, they were clueless of the relationship between law and grace. God bless them. And it was a time of transition uh, in belief. And transitions are always difficult, and they always take time. And these men, they weren't making the transition very, aware, uh, very well. And aware of it or not, they were doing something very dangerous. They were attempting to mix law and grace as they poured, as Jesus would say, new wine into old wineskins. And they're stitching up the veil, let's say, that was torn, that Jesus tore. They were blocking the freeway that Jesus opened up for us to get to God. They were rebuilding the wall that used to stand between God and people that Jesus tore down, Ephesians 2 tells us that. They were putting up this heavy Jewish yoke on Gentile shoulders right here. And they were saying that a Gentile had to become a Jew before they could become a Christian. You got it? So they had to go backwards before they could move forward. And God pronounced a grave disgust on anybody who preached any other gospel than the gospel of grace, the grace of God. The free, the free work, the free love, the unconditional love and work of God found in Jesus. And this is found in Galatians, Paul's letter, chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. I want you to listen to Paul's words. And maybe after this morning, it'll make a little more sense to you. This is why he wrote, coming out of this whole thing we're looking at, Acts 15. He wrote this, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Jesus. And you're turning to a different gospel, not that there is one. But there are some of you who are, there, there are some who are confusing you, and they want to pervert the gospel of Jesus. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we gave to you, let that person be eternally condemned. Because if we, as we've said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you receive from us, let that one be eternally condemned. Wow, why, why is he saying that? That's harsh. Well, it's because the, the person that teaches this other gospel, that it's Jesus plus what you do gets in. I told you, we, we, we talked about it, I think, thoroughly enough this morning. They were creating false disciples. People that did not thoroughly, fully trust in Jesus' work. They were trusting in what they were doing plus what Jesus did. Which means they're not Christians. Which means when they breathe their last breath here, they go into eternity to pay for their sins now. In a place the Bible calls hell. That's why Paul says, if anybody's teaching people that, they belong in hell because they're sending people to hell. You got it? So when any religious group does tell you, you know, unless you belong to our denomination, or unless you speak in tongues, or unless you believe that Jesus is coming back at such and such a time, or unless you abstain from caffeine or movies or whatever, they cannot possibly know our Jesus. Because that group is adding to the gospel, the good news that salvation is absolutely free to you and me. And they're also denying the finished work of Jesus. Salvation is holy by God's grace. It is a gift. It is the cross plus nothing. So there it is. Now, is anybody not a Christian in a group this big? I know the stats. Chances are there's some people not Christians. Well, how do you jump into this? How do you make sure that you're going to be in heaven forever? Uh, here it is. And here it is in one sentence. Right here, right now, you just inside here, you say, God, I'm believing what I'm hearing today. 
that Jesus lived the life I needed to live, I should have lived, flawless, sinless. And then he died on a cross for my sins. He who owed you nothing paid for what I owe you. I believe that. You say that, you have just begun that relationship with God as one of his people. That's it. Got it? So you got to do that. Plus, you got to give a thousand dollars a month to the church. <laughs> Anything else we do as Christians is a get to, not a have to. It's a beautiful thing. So if if you just had that little conversation with God for the first time, do not leave this place without telling me. Just tell me. Just let me know. Come up afterwards. Say, hey, I, I said that. Great. I want to give you your next next step. Um, and um, because you want to learn, you want to grow. You, you, you want the God that you just spoke to to fully enter your life and all of your situations, your, just your, your whole life, and it's going to be a great decision. Anybody regret becoming a Christian? <laughs> Not one hand. Isn't it great? Yeah. Quite a ride. Nothing like it. <clears throat> And, you know, and it's great. And he, and he gives us a family. You know, a lot of us, you know, families are uh, a lot of rough family situations. You might have come from a horrific one. You might have a broken family, uh, whatever. Well, this is, this is a family right here. And a lot of love here, a lot of grace and support here. And it's wonderful to belong to this family. This is his family. This is what he calls us to be a part of. Let's pray. Daddy, we're so grateful uh, for what you taught us today. And we pray that the truth of your word this morning will result in our freedom from thinking that we have to make you like us. And may your truth provide us with a contagious joy that's going to fulfill your purposes to us. That your truth is going to give us the message that's going to match the deepest need in the minds and hearts of our unbelieving friends that you're going to show them through us the love and acceptance that's waiting for them in a relationship with Jesus, just like you showed it to us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.